Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm trying to share my screen, but not quite successfully. Okay, I'm going to... Um, stop. Okay, I think this will work. Can everybody see my screen now? Yusuf, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, yes, it's visible. Okay, so I'm going to start the slideshow. Just let me know if this, this is okay. Uh, can you see the first screen, the first slide? Yes, it is visible. Okay, very good. All right, so Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So, this lecture, we will discuss the issue of needs, wants, and scarcity. And the goal is to show that this idea of scarcity is completely wrong. And uh, the methodology adopted to uh, end scarcity in economics is completely wrong. And Islam offers a completely different and unique approach to the subject. So we have two radically different perspectives. One is that the central economic problem is scarcity. There is not enough goods to satisfy all wants and needs. And so the solution is to produce more goods. And that is growth. As opposed to this, there is the point of view of degrowth, that growth is actually destroying the planet. We are exploiting the planet at a rate which is beyond sustainable, causing a lot of harm. And so we need to stop growing and, uh, and actually reduce our standards of living so that we can survive and the flora and the fauna of the planet can survive. Uh, the climate crisis that is uh, actually is not a crisis, it's a catastrophe. Uh, thousands of species have already been destroyed. And uh, uh, it seems like if we don't do things to change things, then the humanity itself will not be able to inhabit this planet if the temperature rises too far. So we need um, urgently to avert the climate crisis. And uh, today, what I'm going to argue is that Islamic teachings are uh, essential. They provide the foundation for uh, uh, and uh, uh, a philosophy and an ideology, which is the only possible way to avert the climate crisis. Well, Allah Ta'ala tells us that there are two highways that he has shown us. And the first highway is the one of scarcity, that the solution is growth. But uh, the Prophet وسلم, said that uh, scarcity is a mindset. Uh, uh, the true richness is contentment of the heart. And so it cannot be removed by having more and more. In fact, the opposite is true. The more you get, the more you desire. So instead of trying to buy more and more goods to reduce scarcity, you have to try to learn to be content with what you have. So where we stand as a whole is... Uh, very interesting quote of Keynes, which I have uh, linked here. It is long, so I'm just going to summarize what it says. And basically what Keynes says is that pursuit of wealth is actually a psychological disease because um, if you just go for money without using it, uh, that's uh, meaningless. I mean, you waste your life earning money and you die with it in the bank account. And that's actually uh, also... Uh, mentioned in hadith that a man says that this is my wealth, this is my wealth, but the wealth only 
belongs to him which he uses up actually and the rest belongs to his heirs but what kane says is that regardless of the fact that this is a psychological disease we must uh, infect people with this disease because that will lead to production of wealth if we if people are content with what they have then they will not produce more goods and wealth will not accumulate and he thinks that he says explicitly that once wealth accumulates and everybody has enough for all their needs and wants then there will be an amazing change in people because now they will be satisfied and content and happy and then they will no longer uh, do crimes and they will become kind and generous and compassionate because they don't need any more so they will have enough they, they they will give to others but he says that this time is not yet beware that we have to wait for a century or so uh, and we have to just let avarice and greed be our gods so he says that make greed your god because that will allow wealth to accumulate once we have enough wealth then we can stop this and we can uh, afford to realize that greed is bad so this is what kane said and this is actually what the whole world is doing right now if you look at all the world the ministries of finance the uh, the the uh, ministries of planning the kings and the presidents and the prime ministers they are all pursuing madly economic growth and if some uh, some some regime some president some prime minister achieves a high growth rate he says that good i have done what was needed if somebody does a low growth rate then he is voted out so but actually if you look at the data economic growth growth has not led to prosperity and uh, actually actually the opposite is true and the solution to our economic problems does not lie in growth it lies in degrowth this is rather paradoxical and surprising because we have been trained to believe otherwise but we must reduce the amount of production if we want prosperity and welfare and that's basically because what islam teaches us that scarcity is a mindset it cannot be removed by growth it only increases with growth so today the major item on the agenda because people have recognized that growth is not working is causing a lot lot of harm so they say that what we should do is sustainable development that we should do growth because there is no alternative to growth but what we need to do is to uh, manage the harmful side effects so this is right trying to put a bandaid on the problems but it will not work what we need to do is rethink the entire economic model from the ground up starting from the wealth of nations by adam smith he put the whole discipline on the wrong track and the foundation to create such a radical change does not exist in western intellectual tradition they can only make patches so it's up to us muslims to provide uh, these foundations because uh, uh, it's a critical need of modern times and nobody else can do it uh one thing to realize is that economics is a religion and it this is the religion which replaced christianity although it claims that this is positive and factual uh it claims to deliver knowledge free from doubt but actually what is done is by taking the metaphysics and the morals and the personal beliefs and naming it as scientific methodology so uh one of the to to a far greater extent than people realize sam wilson's textbook on the foundations of economics created the modern discipline of economics and sam wilson was actually a disciple of keynes so he had the same idea that we have to infect people with greed to create growth uh eventually growth will solve the problems that we face so one of the critical things to understand about this capitalist religion is that the bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil but capitalism says that lack of money is the root of all evil and the accumulation of wealth is the solution to all problems facing mankind in fact um, because this accumulation of wealth is at the heart of capitalism it's built on on uh, producing more and more and uh, getting people to labor more and more to produce 
and with this extra labor they get income and this income they buy goods so this is complete trap you are caught in a cycle of laboring to produce useless goods and uh, earning income to buy useless goods so everybody is just caught in this vicious cycle in which you keep doing more and more things for the sake of nothing those extra goods get you nothing in terms of pleasure uh, and you have to labor very hard to get them so you basically end up wasting your lives but all the economic statistics show that something good is happening gnp is increasing so welfare is increasing which is actually false so islam offers us the opposite perspective making accumulation of wealth the goal is the source of all our current problems and once we understand this <laughs> then we can get to the place where we uh, we we can recommend degrowth as the uh, way to go for the future so let me describe a personal experience which um, led me to the understanding that i had been brainwashed by capitalism like everyone is that money is the source of all our problems so at uh, in 1980 um, one of the elders of the belief was giving a talk in the new york merkaz and he talked about idol worship he said that you know you guys think that you are very smart and uh, that the um, people of mecca they <clears throat> they created these uh, idols with their own hands and then they started worshiping them how stupid uh, so i said yes of course <clears throat> this is true they were very stupid he then took out a dollar bill <coughs> and he said that uh look we have printed this piece of paper by our own hands but you believe and he sort of looked at me at least it felt to me like he was looking at me <coughs> you believe that if you have this you will be happy and content and secure and people will respect you and admire you if you don't have this then no one will respect you uh you will be hungry you will be insecure you will not be able to uh enjoy a happy life and so i looked into my heart and i said yes i have all of these beliefs he said what's the difference between you and the idol uh, worshipers so i said this is true that i think that the source of my contentment and happiness so that is what <clears throat> started my engagement with tabligh and i realized that this feeling in my heart that the wealth is the solution to all my problems is wrong and uh, this is something that i have been taught to believe but i must undo this i must cleanse my heart otherwise um, it will not be good <clears throat> so the father economics he said that uh, wealth of nations is the key and how the whole book is about how nations can uh, create wealth and that is actually the perspective of the colonizer of the world that they were looting the world to acquire wealth but what is the perspective of our prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he says that allah taala didn't give me this message to accumulate wealth he said that you should uh, make the praise of allah and uh, make sajda and uh, worship and until uh, the death comes <clears throat> the quran says clearly that the, uh, the pursuit of wealth is not the solution that if someone has wealth and sons this doesn't mean that allah taala likes him or that he has achieved prosperity and of course allazi jama'a malun wa addada allah taala gives the examples of fir'aun and qarun to show that power and wealth are not the uh, desired goals to strive for uh one of the things that keynes said and thought and very many people believe that if we have a lot of money then we will stop um, then we will be content and we will become generous and we will be happy but and and so that will solve the problem of scarcity but the quran tells us the that this is not true <clears throat> that people think this is very explicit that people think that if we have enough wealth then we will give sadaqa from it but actually when they get more they do not do this they cling to it and they ask for even more 
And so the Islamic solution to our problems is rather unique and different. And it says that we should fulfill our needs, but we uh, should not uh, go for our wants. Needs are rather bro broadly defined and they are limited. And so they can be fulfilled. Wants are unlimited and they expand upon fulfillment. fulfillment. So it's impossible to satisfy wants. So the goal that of economics that we want to satisfy all needs and wants, this is impossible. And trying to satisfy wants creates unhappiness instead of unhappiness. So the Islamic solution to the problem that our wants are unlimited is to prohibit these wants. Learn to be content with what you have. And if you do that, you will get rich and fulfilling lives. So uh, to be a little bit clearer, uh, needs are defined generously. Islam does not uh, uh, tell us uh, for about Rahbaniyat. It doesn't say that you should live in a cave and uh, have minimal standard. It says, no, uh, be comfortable, eat, drink, even wear your beautiful clothes. So we are allowed for needs. We are allowed for comforts. We are allowed for beautification. But no israf, no tabzir, no conspicuous consumption. This is the most important that uh, we buy things in order to make other people jealous of us. Or we buy things because everybody else has them, so we want them too. Capitalism depends on this excess consumption. And uh, we are all trained in capitalism. So all of us have bought things which we never used. We purchased them from the store and we put them somewhere thinking that we will use them. And eventually we threw them away without ever using them. So that's Israf. So Allah Ta'ala teaches us that <clears throat> uh, the, the those who are... Um, preferring the life of the world, they will find hellfire. And those who prefer, uh, the, the those who fear Allah will prevent ourselves from idle desires. So we are not supposed to pursue our wants. And that is part of the uh, what we have to do to gain paradise. So pursuit of idle desires is prohibited in so many different verses that I could not gather them all. But uh, some of the ones are, uh, the, the one of the uh, clear verses about Israf and Tabzir, that these are brothers of Shaitin. And uh, so that's very harsh uh, condemnation of Israf and Tabzir. And there's a very interesting verse that, uh, very interesting verse in the Quran that because this world is meaningless, the pursuit, the gold and silver that we think is so important is just completely meaningless completely useless, Allah Ta'ala says, I would have made these houses of the unbelievers of gold and silver. But the problem is that because Allah Ta'ala has put the love of Allah uh, of these things in our hearts, he said that everybody would have said, oh, who has seen the heaven? Uh, let's uh, enjoy gold and let's uh, um, disbelieve so that we can get this gold and silver. Allah Ta'ala says, this is only a temporary, short-lived enjoyment. And the real the real uh, and permanent gain is in the Akhirah. Mm -hmm. So, um, it is said clearly that if you have a value of gold, you will want another one. So uh, clearly yeah, that, you know, if somebody has wants you, you fulfill these wants. It doesn't lead to satisfaction. It doesn't lead to satiation. If you, if you, 
you give everyone. so nothing said, uh, having a million dollars is not enough to uh, to create um, satisfaction so basically the economist idea which is being currently pursued by the whole world that the uh, problem of scarcity can be solved by growth is simply false doesn't work so uh, one of the most uh, important discoveries of the past few decades is the easterlin paradox which uh, comes at the same issue but instead of you know um, supporting it from the quran we use empirical evidence so he finds that massive increases in wealth did not lead to increase in human welfare if we take this seriously then the whole uh, whole of this discipline becomes completely destroyed we we have to just throw adam smith into the dustbin and rebuild economics and this is what we need to do uh, rewrite the wealth of nations and basically the, is what islam teaches us the wealth of nations is the people the human beings they are the most important of the creation one life is worth all of humanity so that is where we have to focus our efforts if we follow an islamic approach as gadi said there's enough for everyone's need but not enough for everyone's greed so if we pay attention to satisfaction of needs and prohibit fulfillment of desire there would be no scarcity food supplies per capita have been rising over the past two centuries for which we have data they are more than enough to feed everyone on the planet even if you <clears throat> isolate continents and look at africa which is the worst in terms of food uh, the food supply per capita in africa itself is enough to feed everyone in africa uh today the cosmetic industry of the world uh has enough revenue to uh end hunger on the planet and the us defense budget is sufficient to provide for basic needs of all humans on the planet so what this means is that what we have in terms of productive capacity is enough to provide for the needs of everyone on this planet so there is no scarcity uh but what is not recognized is the critical teaching of islam that there is a right in the wealth of the rich for the poor and this is beyond zakat to whatever is necessary to provide for them so this is the critical teaching of islam which is not understood not recognized uh, uh, by not acknowledged by economics um that anybody who has more than what he needs some proportion of this wealth should be used to fulfill the needs of others 2 and 1/2% is the minimum uh, but uh, actually whatever is needed and if this simple thing was implemented and many people from secular grounds have recognized this piketty for example and many others that what we need is a wealth tax if we just say that okay you can have billions but just make sure that uh, to wipe out hunger on the planet do your part i mean give give them a, a proportion that okay the total needs of the hungry are so much it's not too much i've the figures uh, slip my mind right now it's something like 150 billion dollars or something like that some trivial amount for the uh, major players in the game and so if we just say okay take the top 10 billionaires and ask them to pool money to wipe out hunger they can do it uh, so the idea that scarcity is the problem is just a a trap is just a blindfold it makes us look in the wrong direction instead of looking to the source which is the greed and accumulation by the top uh, the the wealthiest and that's precisely where they don't want us to look they say okay we don't have enough let's try to grow some more food and grow some more uh, products but when they do all of that surplus gets ends up in the pockets of the already wealthy <laughs> so eastern paradox let me just go a little bit more into it but uh, details are available uh, easily from the literature what he did was he analyzed time series data so he looked at the usa and other countries for which data was available 
And he said that, you know, life standards have increased so much that the, every, the, the average person lives like the princes used to live 100 years ago. <clears throat> but has the, does this mean that the society has increased in happiness? He was surprised to find that the answer is no. One of his papers is entitled, Does Money Buy Happiness? And he comes to the conclusion, no. Similarly, in a cross section, you look at countries <clears throat> at the same period of time, and you find that Cuba, which had uh, income level of one tenth of that of USA, had roughly similar <clears throat> level of happiness. So there was no correlation between GNP and happiness. And so basically, that's what Islam teaches us that wealth cannot buy happiness. <clears throat> and uh, there is no increase in welfare due to the pursuit of idle desires. <clears throat> it's useful to understand why the Easterlin paradox occurs. And basically, uh, one key is to understand that, yes, if I fulfill somebody's needs, if somebody's hungry and I feed him, that does increase welfare. But if somebody wants to listen to music and we fulfill that want, that doesn't lead to increase of welfare. <clears throat> uh, why not? There are two things which operate. One is habituation. Once you get used to a certain standard of living, <clears throat> then that becomes your new normal. Now, when you get it, that doesn't make you happy. It's just, just what, what is normal. But if you don't get it, you become unhappy. Initially, if you, if you don't have air conditioning and you get it, you become very happy. But later on, you expect air conditioning as the norm. And now when you go out of your uh, house, to uh, you feel unhappy. <clears throat> so uh, the other thing is relativity or social comparison. <clears throat> when you get the first car in your neighborhood, you feel very happy because you have something nobody else has. But when everybody else gets them, then it no longer gives you happiness. So the problem is, so it's uh, consumption is like a drug addiction. <clears throat> you consume a little bit and it makes you happy temporarily, but then you get used to it. And now you must get the same level of consumption for to live a normal life. And if you don't get that, you become unhappy. <clears throat> so, but, but as you increase your standard of living, you have to have uh, um, you have to labor harder. You have to work more to uh, maintain that labor. So, so in order to, yani, and, and earlier you had you had a low standard of living. You didn't have to work so hard, but now you have a high standard of living, and you must maintain it. You must maintain it because <clears throat> uh, if you don't, uh, you will become extremely unhappy. So it's just like drug addiction. What Galbraith says is that um, um, the urgent wants, the thing we really need, must originate from within us. If they are created, they cannot be urgent. And um, there is no justification to manufacture goods which to satisfy non-urgent needs because what happens in an industrial society, he says, is that uh, manufacture is far in excess of needs and therefore it also manufactures the demand for this excess. So in technical terms in economics, consumption creates a negative exter externality. Yes, you get happy, but everybody else who sees you becomes unhappy because they don't have what you have. And so the value of this excess, it's, it's, a, it's a very strong uh, negative thing. So actually, people who have studied it from completely secular grounds have said that uh, people who uh, have uh, uh, completely um, secular grounds, they have said that uh, we should ban excess conduction. We should make sure to, uh, that everybody has a simple standard of living because if somebody tries to increase the standard of living, one person gets more, 
but thousands of people get unhappy. So it's a, it's a very strong negative externality. So <clears throat> now that's the theoretical foundation for degrowth. And I will um, go somewhat more into this a bit later. But now I want to study the history of capitalism, which was actually the period when this idea of growth started. Basically, you know, we had static societies. Self-sufficiency was the norm everywhere. That <clears throat> that's what we want in a society, that we want to be able to fulfill our needs. The goal of life is not to consume or to produce. The goal of life is to uh, pursue higher achievements like you know spirituality is what but but literary achievement athletics uh, many other things uh, art uh, socialization that's the most important making friends uh, these are the <clears throat> goals of life not the pursuit of wealth so what happened how did pursuit of wealth started Looking at the history of this is very instructive because this history is not displayed in uh, uh, in your textbooks and it's not displayed in the common histories that we read of the European civilization because those are very Eurocentric and they display on, only the virtues of the European society. So it all got started with, uh, with the triangular trade from 1600 to 1800 where uh, basically guns and manufacturers were sent from Europe to Africa and uh, slaves were uh, purchased in Africa and transported across to the Americas. This was called the Middle Passage and it's one of the most horrifying pieces of history uh, uh, in, um, in uh, all of uh, recorded history. Agricultural products produced by these slaves were uh, shipped to Europe. Uh, it's an uh, interesting footnote that uh, part of the reason for the development was that strong Islamic empires blocked European access to Asia. So what was the consequence of this triangular trade? The Europeans became very wealthy. But African societies were destroyed. Uh, lots of African kingdoms, cultures, nations, uh, they no longer exist. Similarly, uh, millions of Native Americans, we can't really count how many there were. There were whole societies and cultures. Uh, they were just completely destroyed. So uh, this was, uh, Europeans became rich. So uh, the wealth of nations uh, did accumulate in the nations of Europe. But would we say that this is progress? Uh, if you look at the Africans and Native Americans, you say that this is the, the catastrophe. Uh, maybe if you think of it from Adam Smithian perspective, then you could call it progress. Although we are going to question that a little bit later, but let's take that for the moment that, okay, uh, pursuit of the, the Europeans progress. Even then, if you add up the numbers, and uh, look at it from the world uh, perspective, you will not count this as progress. You will count this as degeneration. So what does the Quran teaches us about this matter? So is, is it progress to increase your wealth by destroying societies and killing millions and enslaving millions? Uh, well, I think any human being would answer the same way, but Allah Ta'ala specifically says, لا يغرنك تقلب الذين كفروا في البلاد so we should not be deceived by, you know, the pride and uh, pomposity and and the glory that uh, uh, that European wealth brings to them. Uh, this is only a temporary uh, gain, and in the akhirah they will be punished for what they did. Uh, now let's look a little bit more closely at the question: Was this progress for Europeans? Well. Um, those who have studied it said that this, uh, this uh, act, the horrible and inhuman acts that were done to Africans, killing millions and enslaving millions, 
had a very bad effect on the colonizer. It basically dehumanized them. They, they had to believe that these human beings are not human. And uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to sleep. But they were aware. Every nafs knows what it does. They were aware that this is a rationalization. So they had to actually deaden their hearts to the pain of others. But what happens when you deaden your heart to the pain of others is that your heart really becomes dead. And you are unable to feel pleasure also. And this happened to the society as a whole. That uh, because of uh, uh, failure to feel the pain of other human beings, uh, the hearts of the colonizers became deeply damaged. So uh, to avoid this and actually to overcome the loss that came from losing Christianity, the myth of progress was manufactured. Uh, the Europeans defined progress as accumulation of wealth, not as becoming better people. And uh, this uh, is part of the religion of economics, that if we have more money, then we are better off and we are progressing. And so when you use this metric, then you see that there has been a lot of progress in Europe. Although there, is a, uh, uh, there are many ways to counter this idea and to explain that even when you count wealth, if you count the gross wealth, the wealth that people have, and the wealth that they have destroyed in order to get this uh, wealth that they have, then the net comes out heavily negative. What uh, has been destroyed to produce this wealth is much larger than the wealth that has been produced. But anyway, the myth of progress is very strongly rooted <clears throat> in the Eurocentric tradition, and we have also come to believe in it. And this is critical. If you want to decolonize our minds, we need to learn that Europeans did not make progress. And this is hard to do because uh, we have spent years and years of our lives uh, learning to believe that this is progress, what Europeans have been doing. But for a Muslim, it's very easy to understand that this is not progress because there is a very clear and simple and explicit hadith that the best of times is my time. And then after that, and then after that. So it's obvious that the Prophet Sallallahu lived in the best of times and there was not much wealth there. <clears throat> and so wealth is not the criteria of progress and uh, nobody can ever achieve uh, the uh, level of goodness that was present at the time of the Prophet and at the time of the Khulfai Rashidin. So uh, we can say that uh, there has been no progress. <clears throat> It has been up and down, but progress cannot be. The Quran says that the uh, the uh, best of the people sullatum min al awwalin wa qalilum min al akhirin that the best of the people will be a lot in the early times, but few in the later times. So the later times are worse because we have few of the best people. <clears throat> so uh, this critical difference that capitalism measures our progress by the goods we have, whereas Islam measures progress by uh, the level of the character of the people. So when you look at what happens in a consumer surplus, we have culture. We have today the opioid crisis. People have been um, uh, in, in the USA where people manufacture painkillers, which are addictive for massive profits. But this has also led to massive increase in addiction, death, and other health hazards just for the sake of profit. Similarly, on the worldwide basis, uh, <clears throat> Nestle has been advertising their uh, uh, milk uh, powdered formula 
knowing that this will lead to millions of deaths. So just like the slave trade, this thing is going on today. Iraq and Libya and Syria have been destroyed for the sake of corporate profits. And this is known and acknowledged. So this idea that profits is the goal leads to tremendous damage. And uh, it's a false accounting uh, where you count the money, but you don't count the number of people killed to make this money that leads to uh, the illusion that we are making progress. <clears throat> so Islam gives us a lot of tools to counter this consumer culture. Allah Ta'ala tells us that, yes, uh, the things of this world have been made desirable. Uh, our hearts are attracted to them. But Allah Ta'ala has the best things. And this is actually because the life of this world is a test. If we did not have these desires, there would be no test. We would easily, we would be like angels and we would not feel attracted to these things. So this attraction is a necessary part of the test. But Allah Ta'ala tells us that there are two paths that we have shown them the uh, two highways and we have shown them the path and they can choose to be grateful or they can choose to be kafur. So let whoever wants to, let them choose the path to Allah. So the strategy that we need to follow is that uh, we must not prefer the worldly life and we must prefer the akhirah because akhirah is infinite. The worldly life is just a moment. And we must choose the akhirah, the success of the akhirah over the success of this world. We must recognize that the pleasure of this world is an illusion. It seems like a lot, but even those who get these pleasures, they get momentary satisfaction and then they find that it turns to dust, just like the example. I myself remember that I thought that getting a degree from MIT would be the final success and I would have succeeded. Uh, but after I got it, I realized that, oh, a bachelor's is nothing and I have to get a master's and then master's and then PhD at every stage. <clears throat> I was thinking that once I do that, I will be the king of the world. But after accomplishing it, I said, oh, this is nothing. This is just the start. So it's like this. This world is an illusion. We just keep thinking a little bit more and I will succeed. And then when you get that little bit more, uh, you find that it is not success. It is just, uh, just uh, temporary and partial. So this is the way with all worldly accomplishments. When you don't have it, it looks very attractive. When you have it, it turns to dust. And Allah Ta'ala teaches us that this life is short and temporary. Be in this world like a stranger or wayfarer. So now you see, Islamic economics is not a theory in the books. If we want to implement Islamic economics, we have to start with our lives. We have to be Islamic economics, which means implementing these things in our lives. So in the evening, don't expect to so think that this life is temporary. And so don't work hard for it. Instead, work hard for the Akhirah. <clears throat> and one of the key strategies for cleansing our hearts of the love of this dunya is to spend what we love the most. Today, <clears throat> we don't love the consumer goods as much as we love our screen time. So what this is saying that uh, sacrifice that and learn to read the Quran and do zikr and ibadah. And this comes as very, very hard to the nafs. So there are strategies which our elders have recommended that, okay, don't uh, say that, okay, from now on, I take an oath never to watch TV again because you won't be able to do it. <clears throat> so instead, uh, calculate that, okay, I watch six hours or uh, I spend six hours on pleasure. So how much of that can you give up? Maybe you can say that, okay, uh, I can... Uh, 
I can do with five and I will um, make one hour and uh, use it for Ibadah. For, and and uh, then again, there's a lot of different types of Ibadah. You can even watch videos of uh, Abdul Hakim Murad and, and other uh, leaders. So uh, you can be, real, uh, be, be nice to your nafs because if you are too harsh on it, it will rebel and it is very strong. You have fed it so much that it is so powerful that you cannot resist it. So you have to trick it. You have to um, go slow and uh, spend uh, uh, a little bit enough that it, uh, and, and make it agreeable. So choose among the worships, the easy ones and uh, reduce it gradually and make sure uh, that uh, you take steps that you can maintain instead of taking a big step and then coming back. <clears throat> So, one of the things that we need to learn is that Allah Ta'ala tells us that uh, one life is worth the entire humanity. So, this is just in potential. So, learn how we can live so that our life is worth uh, equivalent to all of humanity in the eyes of Allah. We should, we should understand that we are not like that right now, but it is possible for us to achieve that goal because Allah Ta'ala has said that this potential lies within all of us. So how can we live so that we become precious in the eyes of Allah? Allah Ta'ala says that we have created the man in the best of forms. which means that man can be higher than the angels. Uh, he can be made sajda to by the angels. But he can also be the worst of the beasts. So make a self-evaluation. Where do you stand in this continuum? Are we worse than beasts or are we higher than angels? Most people are somewhere in the middle. There is three stages of progress, nafse ammara, which is exactly homo economicus, by the way. Nafse ammara is exactly homo economics and economic theory is the theory of homo economicus or nafse ammara. Most of us are beyond that. Even within the West, even the atheist, they are more uh, like nafse lavama. Although I think there was a survey which showed that about 10% people uh, have become nafse amara. This used to be less, but now because of the preaching of economic theory all over the world, you see a lot of nafse amara, like even 10%. But most people are somewhere in the middle in nafse lavama. So we have to think about how we can move from nafse lavama to nafsil mutmainna. And the goal of a society is to provide a nurturing environment for spiritual progress. And this is very different from the goal of an uh, economic society of Adam Smith to, uh, to accumulate wealth. In fact, accumulation of wealth is an obstacle and hindrance because when we do that, then we don't have time to pursue the things which matter. So uh, the Quran teaches us the, uh, the, the, actually this is Hadith, that wealth uh, it's not that we reject wealth. We are not rahibs. But if our heart doesn't have the love of wealth, then we can, uh, then if wealth comes from Allah, then it is a blessing for us. But if we are greedy, we seek after wealth and we um, try to acquire it, then it does not bring barakah. So this is very a difficult teaching. It requires work to rid our heart of the love of wealth. And uh, basically, uh, it is the love of wealth which is the root of evil. But uh, this needs work. Now, the Quran teaches us that wealth and poverty are both trials from Allah Ta'ala. They are, uh, the wealth is not desirable fi nafsihi for itself. And similarly, poverty is also not desirable because it's a trial. Um, so how can we succeed in the trial by wealth? If we use the wealth, if first of all, if we acquire wealth by halal means instead of haram means, not by colonization. Um, if we acquire wealth by halal means and then we spend it in the way that Allah Ta'ala wants us to spend it, which means that uh, spend on those who need and if, if I have more than what I need, then uh, I should be spending it on needs of others rather than my own wants. 
Cat capitalism teaches us it's precisely the opposite lesson. When you have more than what you need, uh, spend on your own wants, increase your own wants. So we see the effects of this message everywhere in Pakistan, for example. Uh, when I was growing up, it would have been impossible to spend a uh, thousand rupees on a meal, uh, even inflation adjusted because uh, just uh, there was nothing like that available. But today you can spend 10,000, 20,000 on eating a uh, meal in a fine restaurant because as people acquire money, they are also given uh, consumption opportunities. You can buy uh, $50,000 handbags uh, when uh, $1 will feed a person and uh, you could have fed 50,000 hungry malnourished children. But uh, capitalism says, no, don't worry about that. You won't have any information about that. Just buy your handbag. So Allah Ta'ala says that we should use our wealth to purchase the Jannah. Now, <clears throat> if you uh, once you understand Easterlin paradox that consumption doesn't buy us uh, happiness, then uh, secular economists, not economists, but uh, happiness theorists, turn to the study of <clears throat> what actually does lead to long-run happiness. And they came up with very old answers. Basically, it's two things, character and social relationships. <clears throat> this is secular. Otherwise, uh, from an Islamic point of view, it's really our relationship with God, which is central. But um, from the secular perspective, uh, character uh, depends on certain traits like gratitude, contentment, trust, uh, which we have mentioned, and social relationships, loving and being loved. A believer loves and he is loved. Uh, so these are the basis for uh, long-term happiness. Capitalism actually destroys these bases because <clears throat> it promotes hedonism and it promotes the illusion that happiness comes from consumption. This is what's written in all economics textbooks. But actually the family is the primary source of happiness for most people. And this has been destroyed in the West. More than 50% of the children born today in the West are born to single mothers. Uh, <clears throat> this is unfortunately, this culture of individualism and hedonism is spreading rapidly to the Islamic countries <clears throat> and there is no awareness. I mean, people are fighting all sorts of battles in the Islamic world, but uh, the main battle to be fought is to protect and preserve the family and the community and to build social relationships. I have a previous lecture, lecture six on this. <clears throat> so how can we fail in the trial by wealth? Uh, well, if it we puff up with pride and we think that this is uh, because of I did it, then we can, um, and, and then we use this wealth to uh, oppress others. Uh, that is uh, when wealth becomes a source, a curse for us, not a blessing. And so one of the major problems that we face today is because of shock and awe of West, we are following them in all directions without thinking that this following is against the message of the Quran. And so <clears throat> to, uh, to undo this shock and awe, we just need to look at the true history of European colonization. Anyone who reads this true history will uh, simply realize that this is not a path we should follow. They are not a people that we should respect. <clears throat> so I'm going to go over this very quickly because time is up, but there is this book, King Leopold's Ghost, which uh, documents the most horrible crimes uh, committed in human history, where uh, uh, it's, it's almost, it's, it's, it's so horrifying that uh, there is a movie about this and, and a book but only people with uh, very strong stomachs and hearts would be ad uh, advised to, to read this. Uh, it's just too horrible. Then there is the slavery in the middle patches where millions and millions of Africans were transported from, uh, um, from the uh, coasts of Africa to the coasts of the Americas. And this was enormously uh, 
the conditions of these voyages are just uh, unmentionable. And uh, this is now coming out and there are uh, books and articles and documents, but this is very, very, um, again, these are books are, that are so, so gruesome, so horrifying that uh, it's hard to read for anyone who has a heart. Uh, this history of the British Empire by Elkins shows that <clears throat> although they pretended to be fair and just, they used an enormous amount of violence to protect and preserve their empire, and they left a legacy of violence. They, they were so routine in using this violence that this became uh, the pattern in the colonies afterwards as well. In, uh, you can't find any example of the kind of violence that has been done in Islamic history. Uh, we, we, we didn't, uh, uh, any killing is there, but torturing and doing it ruthlessly and enjoying this, this is simply not available except in the colonial history where they treated human beings like animals and beasts. And this has led to uh, what Elkins says is that the current violence that we see around the world is just a legacy of the British Empire because they did it everywhere. So everyone else learned that this is how we should behave. <clears throat> the opium wars is related to the, the economics. China was a self-sufficient economy. They didn't want any goods. So they... But the British wanted a lot of Chinese goods and they had to pay in silver, which they couldn't afford. So what they did was they uh, uh, did uh, war, made uh, China forbid, forbade the sales of opium. So they made war on China in order to prevent, in order to allow the trading of opium and created a massive addict population within China, which didn't exist. And then they were able to sell opium and get money from the Chinese so that they could finance their, uh, their purchases. So this idea that trade is uh, mutually beneficial, this is uh, simply wrong. This is not how it works. Basically, you create needs which were not there, and then you fulfill them. And um, uh, this just leads to a cycle of violence and... Uh, and uh, useless production and useless consumption. <clears throat> British colonialism kill, killed millions in, in India. There are so many gruesome stories. One of them is that they forced the farmers in Bengal to produce export crops so that they could uh, purchase them. And they, they prevented them from producing food which they would use for, to eat. And as a result, millions of people died in the Bengal farm, famine which was created by the British. And then they set up a commission of inquiry to ask how it happened. <clears throat> and this commission found that uh, absolved the British of the blame. So <clears throat> I'm going over time, but the we, we don't need to, basically the thing to do is to look at what happens to the hearts. So when the hearts uh, commit these crimes, they become hard and um, they become blind. They cannot see the reality of what a human being is. So, you see, if you look at this economic theory, Homo economicus, that the purpose of our life is to maximize our consumption, you should laugh at this. How can any sensible person even think such a thing, let alone write it? and teach it and read it and believe it. It's just completely ridiculous and absurd. So the only answer is that their hearts have become blind to the reality of what a human being is. And summa qasat their, their hearts have become hard like stones. And that's why they make these theories. These hearts are unable to connect to human beings. So they, they are, for economists for 50 years, they have been trying to understand why human beings cooperate with each other. When they have a chance to betray the other guy, to put the knife in his back, they don't do it, even though it will bring them a million dollars. Why not? Economists have been puzzling about this for 
decades and they still have are no closer to a solution and the solution is simply that they have the economists have blind hearts and so <clears throat> uh, now we are beginning to see the emergence of islamic psychology so there is abdullah rathman and coil there is article which is available which discusses a model islamic model of the soul there is a book by him and there are other approaches to this but basically we have a ruh which attracts towards the good we have a nafs which attracts towards the evil and so the our hearts are a battleground for good and evil and this is uh, the central battle that we face in our lives and if we do tazkiya of our nafs and we uh, then we can uh, train it to like good and that is the central battle in our lives now our uh, we, uh, minds have been conditioned by orientalism that the um, because europeans colonized us uh, they came to believe that they are superior we came to believe that we are inferior and this is the main problem that we face because we are um, in shock and off western theories and we are not even looking at the quran so very strangely when i was preparing for this lecture i was looking at some articles by islamic economists and these people are just saying that yes growth is good utility maximization good quran has no objections to uh, pursuit of pleasure of the nafs it says uh, that the we love the shahwat min an-nisa so obviously islam has no objections to pursuit of pleasure all sort of ridiculous things which uh, just um, the the thing is not that the west is saying them west has to say them because they reject the akhirah the, the strange thing is that muslim economists are right now in islamic uh, in uh, muslim schools teaching these absurd and ridiculous theories which are against the quran to muslim students so eurocentrism conflicts directly with islam because uh, the quran says and it's obvious intuitively that the message of god to mankind must be superior to any knowledge that can be generated by uh, human minds and so what i am trying to show here is that the economic theory which the west has developed for over 300 years is harmful to mankind it's absurd and ridiculous it's easily rejected and uh, islamic teachings provide us a far superior approach and basically um it comes from yani we we must start from looking at our purpose every all knowledge has to be related to our purpose and the purpose is uh, allah taala has told us is to do good deeds and to make sure that everything we do is for the sake of allah so now we come to the important question what about the non muslims cuz so far i have taken as my audience as muslims because i've been using the quran etc so <clears throat> i have studied this issue very carefully and i have um, tried um, in both ways and i've come to the conclusion that we must follow a two stage process yes the message of islam is for all mankind it is not restricted to muslims only but first we must work among ourselves we must work to become models of islamic behavior then only we can spread the message to others if the islamic world is corrupt and uh, if the islamic world is pursuing growth then we cannot tell to, to non muslims that you should pursue degrowth while we are ourselves pursuing growth so in the first instance uh, and so there they have to be two messages we cannot there is no if we try to abandon the quran and uh give the message of degrowth on secular grounds it it will lack the foundations that are needed so we need to work on the muslims first but the same message can be given to non muslims it is possible to redo this whole lecture and make it attractive to non muslims because allah taala has told us that the hearts of every human being have been implanted with the knowledge of god so recognition of god is built into our hearts for all human beings and <clears throat> so the life of this world is a test and one thing see part of uh, most of this lecture is to try to 
teach us how we should uh, to to uh, impact on our life experiences knowledge is what teaches us how to live if you learn chemistry biology and it doesn't teach you how to live better then it's uh, useless knowledge and it is something which allah taala prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sought protection from so it is a test we face different tests different people face uh, some people face very difficult tests so in this connection there are two uh, promises of allah one is that some the people who are facing difficult tests allah taala will give them the resources to be able to uh, uh, succeed in the test no one is tested beyond his capabilities and also allah taala tells us that he will adjust our grades according to the level of the difficulty of the test and so we are coming to the end of this lecture uh, what is the nature of this test well on the one hand it's actions we we know we should know how to act but knowing how to act is based on knowledge and so the first revelation is all about knowledge it's about read he taught mankind what they did not know but knowing uh, refers to knowledge of the path to god how we can get to allah taala fa man sha attakhaza ila rabbihi sabila so uh, the um wal ladina jahadu fina lanahdiyannam subulana so when the angels complained about how man will do fitna and fasad uh, the answer was that adam alai salam will have knowledge and that is knowledge will make him superior so it's all about knowledge uh, we have to acquire knowledge but we have been the problem with us today is that our brains have been washed and uh, we have been filled this these brains with wrong types of eurocentric knowledge there are several levels of knowledge and Rajab Shanturk has very good lectures on the Islamic theories of knowledge, which are multi-leveled. In Western theory, there is uh, just uh, good and bad. There is just true and false. This binary theory is completely inadequate for a realistic conception of human knowledge. And so we need to look at our heritage to learn knowledge, and uh, that is. uh part of this knowledge is uh, uh, an islamic approach to economics so i've come to the end of my lecture and uh so all right so i think that we are ready for some questions all right so yes Uh, somebody has asked in the chat about how to get the slides well basically this the website for the course which i have uh, given the link to earlier will contain uh, the slides uh, for the lecture eventually i will put them up soon even in this slide there was a link to the slides in fact i think i can put it up uh, i have the link so oh. please uh, raise hand and ask any questions what was this lecture needs wants and scarcity yes so this is the link for the slides which i have just put on all right so are there any questions by anybody Actually, there are several question in the chat box, Prof. All right, can you? Um, yes. Um, what, ask kind, me um, what kind of mindset for entrepreneurs with creating products so we don't intentionally create uh, ones? There is first. The mindset for uh, entrepreneurs. Yes, actually, entrepreneurship is very important part of Islam because Hadith emphasizes that. and this is actually relevant to a very important issue that uh the idea that is put into our minds is that we should become job seekers but every job seeker is actually part of the capitalism capitalist web so we should be looking for ways to escape this web and to create our own living and uh, to create our own business so that uh, and, and this business should be based on on uh, on well there are many approaches to this but 
uh, we should learn in view of the approaching uh, climate catastrophe, we should learn to create communities, agrarian communities, which grow their own food and uh, energy and basically attempt to be as self-sufficient as possible with minimal amount of trades and minimal amount of market. So Rajab Shanturk is the name of the Turkish scholar who will implement the Islamic ideology, uh, implement, uh, Islamic ideology, we will implement it, you and I. Allah Ta'ala has not give, given us priests who will be uh, uh, leaders, but actually it puts the responsibility for the deen on the shoulders of every single person. Uh, yes, Islamic sustainable development, that's... Uh, uh, when you talk about sustainable development, you're saying that we're going to do growth, but we're going to try to make sure that the growth is uh, self-sustaining so it doesn't do environment climatic damage. So this kind of approach can work and it can fail. And uh, yes, of course, the recording will be put on the uh, website for the course eventually, probably tomorrow, day after. All recordings for all lectures are available. Past rather. Any other uh, questions, Lisa, from the yes, past? Which uh, I yes, from Dr. Abdullah. So if Muslims choose to prioritize their needs over the desired, would this mean that they would neither experience relative scarcity nor absolute scarcity? And he also asks about the reason behind the relative scarcity. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, if we choose to prioritize needs and we also realize uh, practice social responsibility. If somebody in our neighborhood does not have enough for their needs, we, uh, we collectively provide for them. Then there would be no scarcity, neither absolute nor relative. This concept of relative scarcity was invented by Islamic economists because uh, the, they wanted to find a halfway point. Uh, they didn't want to reject scarcity, but they also didn't want to reject Fazlullah. But this compromise is, is exactly what the problem is. We, we don't have, we don't make compromises with the West. Maybe we can go to the, those who have pressed hand brought. There are, yeah, uh, brother there is, I don't see any hands on the screen. Uh, <clears throat> brother Hasib, maybe you can. Oops. Oh, okay, yeah. Let me change the view so that. Okay, I see a lot of hands now. Yes. I was in the wrong view. All right, so um, uh, Daniel. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, if you see within the Western uh, tradition and uh, lately the tradition which they follow, uh, they they do have critical scholarship, and you know their scholars do identify these problems such as greed, hedonistic pursuit of happiness, and you know myth of progress, all of these things. Yes. And as as a solution to you know these problems, they they provide a solution which they call workplace democracy. I mean, in the form of cooperatives. This is the first so, time I've heard of it. But go ahead. Yes. Okay. So, uh, or maybe I've understood it wrong. So uh, the thing is, I wanted to understand okay, how do you conceive cooperatives and what is the Islamic point of view towards cooperatives because. Cooperatives do enable the workers to own the corporation, to own the business entity, but then, you know, they are also enmeshed within that discourse of myth of progress and, you know, increasing wealth and all of that. So some... Exactly. I said that, first of all, the mainstream education is the source of uh, shaping of minds. And so in the mainstream economics, I haven't seen any mention of cooperatives anywhere. So basically the minds are, uh, now there are radicals, there are heterodox economists. I'm one of them and they, um, but nobody is listening to them. So what they say or what they don't say doesn't matter. Uh, it's not on the world stage. But even if world was to start to listen to these heterodoxies, to cooperatives, 
First of all, there's lots of examples of failed cooperatives, as in Russia, and in many other places as well. Um, they don't have the, in the West, the intellectual foundations, the ideological foundations on which to build a cooperative society, because they've been studying for too long the idea of that we are just animals, products of evolution, and then state of nature is competition and survival of the fittest. And so to rebuild this whole structure, the foundations on which all of the social sciences is constructed is too much work. So we need to, uh, we can't build on those foundations. We need to build on Islamic foundation. Then we can create an example. And once we have an example, other people will be able to follow. Asher Saeed. Oh. Um, yes. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum So, um, my question is that I'm a I'm a, a homeschooling mother, and I'm trying to uh, come up with a curriculum for children, uh, which uh, which is like we talked about, you know, Ail Manafi. Uh, yeah. which uh, which helps children in, um, you know, gaining knowledge, which is actually beneficial knowledge. So I'm working uh, on uh, different different aspects like the Sira and Allama Iqbal and uh, the world history, things that make sense, you know, things that benefit. So Islamic econ economics is one of my, you know, it has been on my mind uh, for very long. And I'm trying to come up with, uh, because um, and right now I, I'm looking at, um, the mainstream uh, books, uh, for example, you know, you, if you look at the O levels uh, business studies book or the A levels psychology book, I've been going through this. I know students who are studying this, so they all focus on even you know a, a book on psychology. A level psychology will only focus on the psychological behavior of consumers and how to enhance motivation in order for you know, workers to, you know, um, work efficiently for a capitalist um, society. So my question is, how do we, you know, if we, are, if we were to work on a curriculum, how do we incorporate Islamic economics in our curriculum for children? Where do we start from? So I'm looking at the SIRA and I want to understand that how, from, from the SIRA, wh what points do we focus on so that we incorporate this aspect of uh, you know Islamic economics into our children's curriculum from a very young age, so that it does not become something extremely strange to them when they are in their teens. Uh, that's my question. I don't know mm. if I'm clear or not. Yes, that's perfectly clear, and that's a really an excellent question. And uh, basically, uh, let me say that the materials we need do not exist, uh, and they have to be made up. If you look at the standard texts, first of all, you, when you talk about O level, A level, then of course, these are all secular and they are highly, not only highly unsuitable, they are actually antithetical to uh, Islamic purposes. They teach LGBTQ, for example. Exactly. And, um, so, <clears throat> and in fact, that's one of the reasons for homeschooling <clears throat> that you can't avoid this toxin. But even if you look at the Islamic alternative, you look at the textbook of Islamic economics that are available, they don't really do a good job at all. I think even in my past, in my own past work, I have focused a lot on um, critiques, but not so much on um, developing the Islamic alternative. Now, this set of lectures, which I'm currently preparing, this uh, starts from uh, building on Islamic foundations. And this is the first time I've been working on this for 10, 20 years. And finally, I've gotten to this stage where I think that I have something which is usable. But I think what you can do is if you look at my lectures on my website, and a uh, lot, lot of this material is translatable to uh, things that would be understood by children from a very young age, like learning to be uh, uh, gratitude making shukr to Allah for the gifts that he has given, learning to have panat, learning not right. to uh, be consumer, learning to trust in Allah for our future 
and these th these are characteristics which can be taught and th these are the fundamentals but so, yes this is a critical was, issue for the yeah, muslims so, today yes. i was looking at a book that um, that uh, you know the Islam islamic e economics a polar opposite to capitalist economics i think that's your yeah. book so i was yeah. uh, just looking at that and i was wondering would that be would that be helpful no, no. for me that was written about 15 years ago and oh. it's very sophisticated uh, very intellectual uh, not at all suitable for children and hard to read for even adults so but but the current set of lectures is is different right so uh, is is the content of the book not aligned with these lectures are they not completely the lectures are based on the book but they are uh, much simplified and and that right. book itself was written for a secular audience it was addressed to a secular uh, audience so it was not right. built for this this uh, set of lectures is meant only for a muslim audience it's built right. directly on the quran and that, thank you so much that helps me so much thank you okay so yaqub rashid Yes. My audible? Yes, I can hear you. Actually, I want to ask you a question. That mm, what I have learned from this lecture today, actually strongly agree with this thing. But what I felt is like this all the counter philosophical argument against the capitalist society or the capitalist economic system. But what I feel is the need of an R is not to give a counter philosophical argument. or rather than to build a models like we have in capitalist uh, economics or mainstream economics which we are currently studying like we have mathematical we have descriptive modeling there the need of an or should be like our approach should be more like aligned towards this path so that uh, like the earlier question asked by some sister so that we can formulate simpler textbooks uh, like we are just studying in from standard 11 standard 12 so you can develop that form of modeling approach like we have microeconomics macroeconomics so we could align with this main stream argument well i think that trying to align is uh, has been the problem because we cannot align for us there is no micro and there is no macro uh, economics is at the mesoeconomics the community level is the most important for islamic economics the neighborhood a collection of people who are uh, working together cooperating and building and this doesn't exist in normal economics so if we try to align with western frameworks we will uh, simply uh, not be able to align with islamic frameworks so osama yes sir thank you very much assalam alaikum sir okay, i have two sir. questions uh, actually i have written in this on this chat also so developing and advanced economies will survive this degrowth but developing and emerging economies will not what's your take on it and the second question is about the industrial revolution has radically altered men's environment it is to be expected that as technology is increasingly applied to the human body and mind men himself will be altered as radically as his environment and way of life has been changed and the balance of power between individual and the larger systems flipped also when machines made much of the human labor obsolete while simultaneously allowing big corporations and big governments to observe track exclude and social media bans stripping away bank accounts anyone being naughty what's your take on it well let me take the two the two questions are of course very different first of all the idea that the um, poor countries of the world cannot survive degrowth this is wrong uh, basically if you look at the, how russia and china developed you see growth is indiscriminate it says that okay if you increase the number of cars you manufacture then that is growth but um, what russia and china did was that they uh, industrialized but uh, the living they were still right bicycles they were not importing luxury lifestyle simple and we need to make sure that we have 
uh, a technology which is sufficient for defense. And that's exactly what was done by Russia. They channeled all their uh, productivity capacity into essential items, which uh, part of which was defense, but also other things. So basically uh, make sure that you have the hydroponics needed to feed everybody, invest in agriculture so that there is enough food for everybody, uh, invest in the medical sector. So, um, but, but there's a huge amount of waste which is done and that waste can be curtailed and uh, it might look like uh, growth is not going on because the, um, if you look at the GNP statistics, your uh, consumer goods will become less. You will produce simpler things, easier things and, and less things, things which are of less value on the market. And so the price will be less, but you will satisfy the needs of everybody. And so um, as long as you satisfy the needs of everybody, um, the fact that the rich people cannot consume their luxury products will actually be of great benefit to society. So that's one thing. The other thing is technology is a sideshow. And um, if we are believers, then Allah Ta'ala has created man. So technology cannot change man. Uh, the, the test, we, we have been created by Allah Ta'ala and we will die and we will be answerable to Allah Ta'ala. So uh, we have to do good deeds. We have to avoid bad deeds. This fundamental purpose of the creation of the universe cannot be changed by technology. All right, so I think that let's go to Zishan Aziz. <clears throat> yes. There's a lot of noise on your line, but if you talk loudly, we can hear probably. Sir, am I audible? Yes, now. I have, uh, I have two very basic questions. Uh, one is how to bring rise to Islamic system. Uh, your take would only be uh, to get knowledge uh, or uh, any parallel system we, can, we should be working on that. Uh, I mean, uh, first question. Uh, uh, this is very bad. I can't hear you. Put your answer uh, question in the chat box. Let me go on to Iqra. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, firstly, I would uh, like to thank you for putting this lecture out in very easy to understand terms. And secondly, it was nice to see or rather hear the references to my teachers, uh, Dr. Timothy Winter, Sheikh Abdul Haki Murad, and uh, Dr. Abdullah Rotman. So it was nice to hear that from you. Uh, my question, I think, is just me reflecting on the lesson today. And uh, if I were to simplify it for myself, I think. Uh, essentially what I am asked here to do is strike a balance between asceticism, zuhud, and on the other hand, maintaining myself in terms of seeking goodness from this dunya, in terms of um, like God likes beauty, God likes good smell, uh, God likes me to wear nice clothes, things like that. So if I were to um, put it simply for myself and also I think what people don't realize is is pressure around me for example my parents are essentially economical migrants to this country and then they would um, urge me to look into options of buying a house or mortgage for example or things like that so that old system needs changing but it probably starts from me and I would actually like to seek your advice more on how this can be infiltrated to change my parents mindset in a way so if you yeah. can please now the thing is Kay, um, actually a lot of people after my lectures contact me on my personal challenges uh, when uh, uh, to ask for personal advice on how to um, manage. And, and this is, has to be complicated because um, it, it's very particular to your personal situation as to 
what your career path should be, how you should use your life. So I'm very happy to advise, uh, but this is something which is very individualized. So I will um, pass on that and uh, ask you to contact me directly separately. Okay. Sure, I'll do that. Can you at least comment on the first part of my question in terms of striking a balance between these two things? Yeah, normally, you see, um, if I look at myself, we are so heavily imbalanced on the side of, you know, preferring this life of this world to that of the Akhara, that um, this, this is not a big issue. I mean, if I'm spending uh, eight hours on pursuit of worldly pleasures and one hour on my deen, then I should work for uh, reducing uh, worldly pursuit to seven hours and increase my deen to two hours. And so, uh, I mean, there, are, there were Sahaba who were given the opposite advice. There was this Sahabi who was spending all his days in uh, fasting and all his nights in worship. And the Prophet ﷺ told him that, look, your body has rights upon you and your wife has rights upon you and so on. And your nafs has rights upon you and so on. So, but that's that's really. Uh, I don't think that there's anybody in this world right now who is uh, who would need that advice. But actually, what happens is that people who are uh, deeply into the dunya they cite the sahadis that look. <laughs> so, so it's uh, it's it's uh, cited for in the opposite of what was intended to do. <clears throat> that's very insightful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, people are asking practical questions about how to implement the system. I, I was, um, there are a couple of things. The lecture six was about precisely this issue uh, that uh, how do we go about loosening the grip of capitalism upon us and how do we uh, create an uh, Islamic system. And lecture seven was addressed on the current economic problems of Pakistan and how we can solve them. So if you want to look at practical applications of these ideas, go back and look at lectures six and seven. All right, Haseeb Mujtaba. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Can you hear me, Sheikh? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. First of all, Professor, thanks a lot for giving such an opportunity to all of us. And uh, this is such a, I can't explain it. So I, I, I'll go direct to my question. I have a question and it has two aspects, both connected. Uh, first one is that if we want to learn Islamic economics, we have to learn the philosophy of Islam towards the economics. And uh, how does it work and what is its most fundamental element like people, not the money as you have explained. Now, I want to understand this philosophy myself. What should I do? What literature should I consume? I'm a mechanical engineering student and I have no economics background. And that's, that's good, I suppose. And uh, this is the first aspect. And the other aspect which is connected one is, uh, if, even if I learn the philosophy, even if, which is like an algorithm, you put a prompt, it gives you a response accordingly. Even if I learn it, inspire my family members, I can see that if people like you who are really informed and highly educated and seasoned people are finding it close to impossible to overthrow the discourse of consumerism and implement the system of Allah, how can I make myself the right person or the competent person to be the part, a brick of this wall. Thank you. Well, I think that I have tried to answer these questions very specifically in uh, my lectures. So I think if you just go through my lectures, and as you said, not knowing economics is an advantage, not a disadvantage, because economics actually gives you wrong ideas, and then you have to first get rid of them, and then you can understand. But if you don't have any economics, you have not been brainwashed. And so you'll be able to understand more easily. Uh, so if this is the eighth lecture, if you just go through the lectures, there's a lot of material in here. In this material also, there's a lot of references. And many of this is very condensed. And in the lectures, I give pointers that if you want to read more about this, 
go to this source, read this book, watch this video, etc. So there is the, the even though the lectures themselves are only eight, if you just follow up the references, there is a huge amount of material. So if you want to study, this will be um, this will be enough uh, uh, to just go through the lectures in sequence, which are all available conveniently, easily on the website. Okay, so I think that we have gone over the time and I don't see any more hands. And uh, if there is any more, one more question, I can take it. But um, if you have somebody in uh, chat, uh, you can write something or Daniel, okay. Okay, let this be the last question. Uh, by the way, I see in the chat uh, people talking about the IMF and etc. So I've answered all of those questions. Yani. I have discussed about power and what we can, how we should respond to that. Uh, just go through the past lectures, uh, you will find the answers. Okay, Daniel. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. I just want to ask, I mean, uh, while you were responding to my question previously, what I understood is this, that cooperatives, actually there is no problem, but as far as the value which is driving those cooperatives is, is problematic. Actually, Islam has its own theory of the firm, and it is actually cooperative. But uh, the central difference is that our goal is not to make profits. Our goal is to serve our community. And so uh, this creates a setup which is rather different from anything that I have seen. So our bottom line is how much service did we provide to the community and the earning we make is only what is needed to provide this service. I mean, if we don't make any earnings, then we won't be able to continue this task for long. So this conception of the firm is rather different from anything that I have seen. So uh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, can you provide some resources or provide some links to those resources through which I can understand what is the Islamic theory of a firm? Uh, it's available in my works. If you look at my um, articles, I have discussed okay. this in a number of different places. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, I think that we will uh, call it which at this point, uh, there are many places where you can ask questions. There's my website, of course, in which I have normally post most of these lectures and you can put a question in there. Uh, my contact information is easily available. Anybody who's on my mailing list uh, has my email and you can ask me directly via email. So um, let's uh, stop here. And Subhana Rabbi Karabbil Uzzati Amma Yasifun. والسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين. Okay, so we can end recording here.